Jumping is one of the most important parts of any platformer game, but without the right physics and collision settings, a game could feel really clunky. This is part 3 of a 4 part series where I will show you how to create a perfect character controller. Today, I will show you how to set up ground collision and how to work with gravity and drag to give your player full control over where they are jumping. We're going to work directly from our last video's project, so you might want to watch that video first. As you can see, we've written a script to get our character to run around the scene. So naturally, the next step here is to give our character the ability to jump. In order to do this correctly, we need to make sure our character is touching the ground first, since we don't want him to be able to jump while floating in the air. So if you haven't done this already, go ahead and set your ground object to a specific layer. In our case, we've set our ground tiles to a layer called ground. If you don't have this layer, you can create one by going to add layer and then typing it in. Then we're going to write some code to detect if our player object is colliding with this specific layer. So back in our code, under components, let's set a public layer mask called ground layer. Then we want to draw a ray cast to the bottom of our player and check to see if this collided with the ground layer. If it does, then it means we are grounded. So let's create a boolean to keep track of this called on ground. Then to stay on par with our organization, let's set another header called collision where we can keep track of all our collision references. Now the way raycasts work is that they draw an invisible line on the screen from an origin point to a certain direction. This is used a lot in shooter games to check if an enemy is in the path of a bullet that is being fired. As defined in Unity, we have a few parameters that we can pass through to this function. We have origin, which is the place we want to start the raycast. Direction, which is pretty self-explanatory. Distance, which is an optional parameter that can be set to limit how far the raycast is drawn. And the last parameter is layer mask, which lets us to detect colliders that are only on a certain layer. In our case, we only want to check if our raycast touches our ground tiles. At its simplest form, a raycast looks something like this, where you have a position in the form of a vector 2 or vector 3, and then a direction, which in this case is the up direction. This will essentially draw an invisible line straight up in the air to check if there are any colliders above our object. So back in our script, we want to apply this function to our character, except we want to draw a raycast underneath our character to check if it's touching the ground. This next part might be a little overwhelming, so I'll explain it slowly. We want to check for this collision each frame, so let's define our on-ground boolean in the update function. Then let's write physics2d.raycast, and like we just went over, let's put an origin point for the first parameter, so in our case, let's set this to our transform.position. This will place our origin point directly in the center of our character sprite. Then in the second parameter, we need to define the direction we want to draw this line. So let's put vector2.down to indicate we want to draw downwards. Then since we don't want this line to be infinite, let's set a length for our line here. I'll explain how to figure this number out in a second, but for now, we just want this number to be equal to a little more than half our character's height, so I'm going to put 0.6. And for the last parameter, put ground layer. So now back in Unity, if we go over to our inspector, let's make sure to define our ground layer to the layer in which our ground tiles are on. Now if you look closely, the minute our character drops to the ground, our on-ground boolean becomes true. This is because our raycast collides with our ground tiles. I chose a length of 0.6 for our raycast because we want our raycast to be just long enough to be outside our edge collider, but not too long where it detects the ground before we are touching it. Although this is hard to see, so instead let's use a gizmo to visualize this line. So let's go back into our script and set a reference for our line length. So under collision, let's write public float ground length and let's set this to a default of 0.6. Then let's use a built-in Unity function called onDrawGizmos and be sure to spell it exactly like that. Then let's set the gizmo color and for this one I chose red so let's write gizmos.color equals color.red. And like a raycast we can draw a gizmo line. This works by passing a starting point and an ending point. So let's write gizmo.drawLine and for the first parameter let's put transform.position. Then for the second parameter, let's put transform.position plus vector3.down times ground length. This takes our ground length value and basically just puts it on the y axis. Then quickly, let's replace our 0.6 in our raycast with ground length and go back into Unity. Now, what's cool about Gizmos is that we have a visual representation in our scene view of what our raycast now looks like. As you can see, my red line just nearly exceeds the edge collider boundary box. If I was to press play, you can see my on-ground boolean becomes true the minute the red line touches the ground tiles. And this becomes more obvious when I adjust my ground length value in real time. 
If I go ahead and shorten my line so it's inside my collider box, all of a sudden this unchecks our on-ground boolean. So go ahead and adjust this ground link value until you find a value that works perfect for your character. Now that we have ground detection set up for our character, it's now time to write a function to make our character jump. So back in our script, let's create a new function called jump. And then inside this function, we're going to do two things. First, we are going to reset the vertical velocity by writing rb.velocity equals new vector 2. And for the x parameter, let's set it to the current horizontal velocity or rb.velocity.x. And for the y parameter, let's just put 0. And now that we have stopped all vertical movement, let's apply a vertical force. We can do that by writing rb.addForce. And for the first parameter, let's put vector2.up multiplied by 15f. And then for the second parameter, let's put force mode 2 dimpulse The first parameter tells the rigid body where to apply the force, and then we multiply by 15 to tell it how strong we want that force to be. Then the second parameter is us telling the rigid body we want this force to be instant. We can easily replace this 15 value with a public reference, so let's just go ahead and do that by writing public float jump speed. And then also, let's replace it at the bottom. Now with a function dedicated to us jumping, let's define it somewhere to see it in action. For this example, we're going to use the built-in jump input, which for a keyboard, this happens to be the spacebar. So in our update function, let's write if input.getButtonDown, and in parentheses put jump, and then let's also write and on ground to indicate we only want to jump if we are touching the ground. And then let's declare our jump function. So now let's save the script and go back into Unity and press play. When I press my spacebar on my keyboard, my character now jumps into the air. And since we have ground detection, we should only be able to jump when our character is touching the ground. But if your scene is set up like mine, you may experience that our character floats slowly back to the ground. The reason for this is because in our last video, we installed a linear drag on our character whenever we let go of our directional inputs. So to get this jump perfect, we actually want to modify this drag in real time as well as our gravity. Back in our script, we want to create two public floats. The first is a public float for gravity, and let's set this to 1. The second is a public float called fall multiplier, and let's just set this to 5. Boards to Bits makes a great video explaining how to pull off a better jump by multiplying the gravity on a downwards velocity. To cover the basics, we want to set up our character so that it has no gravity when it is touching the ground. The minute we are no longer touching the ground, we want to apply gravity to our object. This keeps our object running smoothly. Then when we press the jump button, we want to apply a gravity multiplier to force our character immediately back into the ground. But like seen in a lot of platformer games, we want to delay that multiplier if the player is holding down the jump button. So if a player taps the jump button, the character jumps just a little bit, but if they hold the jump button, the character reaches a higher distance. So down in our modify physics function that we created back in episode two, let's make some modifications. Firstly, let's wrap this code in an if statement because we only want to apply it if the character is touching the ground. So let's write if on ground and then close the bracket underneath it. Since we don't want any gravity when our character is touching the ground, let's set rb.gravityScale equal to zero. Then let's write an else statement and for the first line, let's put rb.gravityScale equals gravity so that we apply our gravity the minute our character leaves the ground. Then we also want to remove our linear drag, but not completely. I played around with this number a lot and my conclusion is that it's best to use 15% of our drag value. So let's write rb.drag equals linear drag times 0.15. Then the first thing we want to do is check for downwards velocity so we can apply our fall multiplier. So let's write if rb.velocity.y is less than zero, and if that's true, let's put rb.gravityScale equals gravity times fall multiplier. Then let's do an else if statement that says if rb.velocity.y is greater than zero, and we are not holding the jump button or input.get button jump, if that's true, we want to set rb.gravityScale equal to gravity times half of full multiplier or full multiplier divided by two. This last part means that if we were moving upwards but we've released our jump button, we want to limit our jump to a smaller height. If we are holding our jump button down while our character is moving upwards, it will naturally move higher in the scene because our gravity value will only be one. So now if we go back into Unity and press play, we should see we now have two different types of jumps. If we tap the jump button, our character goes only so high, but if we hold our jump button, our character hits the ceiling. This is obviously too much jump force, so I'm just going to bring my jump speed value down to 8. And now this becomes more obvious as I try and jump over these gaps. If I hold the jump button, I jump over these gaps and fall into the second gap. 
but if I just simply tap the jump button, I have better control over where I am jumping. Now, the next thing I want to focus on is improving player experience. There are two things I noticed that can be improved upon when jumping around. The first thing is that if we are leaping around at a fast pace, we have to hit a frame-perfect jump to have our character jump the minute it hits the ground. The problem is if you miss this frame, the character won't jump when you press the jump button, leaving the player frustrated. What makes games like Celeste and Super Mario feel so natural is they factor in this button latency by allowing players multiple frames to tap their jump button. If we go back in our script, this is actually very easy to implement. First, let's create a public float called jump delay and set it to 0.25. This will represent how long we want our delay period to be. Then let's create a private float called jump timer where we will keep track of how long since we last pressed the jump button. Then down in our update function, let's modify our if statement here. Let's go ahead and get rid of on ground and our jump function. Instead, let's put jump timer equals time dot time plus jump delay. Then down in our fix update function, let's write a new if statement. If jump timer is greater than time dot time and is on ground, then let's declare our jump function. What we do here is set a jump timer to a value in the future based on our jump delay value, which happens to be 0.25 seconds. So if current time is less than our jump timer, we are within the jump delay period. Therefore, we should jump on the exact frame our player hits the ground. And then let's scroll down to our jump function and set our jump timer to equal zero to prevent our player from jumping more than once. And now if we test this in Unity, we should see this effect in action. If I put my jump delay up to one second and press the jump button while in the air, we should see our character jumps the minute it hits the ground. So go ahead and adjust this value to a time interval which gives your character a nice feel. Another enhancement to this jump experience is adjusting our raycast ground collision. Right now we have just a single line going down the middle of our character. This becomes a problem when our character tries to jump off an edge. See, if I move my character where he is currently hanging off the edge, but our red line isn't colliding with the floor, our script thinks our character is not on the ground and prevents us from being able to jump. We can fix this easily by setting up two raycasts, one for each of our character's legs. So back in our script, let's define a new public vector three called collider offset. Then let's go down to our on draw gizmos function and let's modify our draw line. For the first and second parameter, let's add collider offset to the transform position. And then let's duplicate this line and let's subtract Collider Offset. A quick peek in Unity shows us that now when we adjust our Collider Offset X value, we have two red lines. Let's go ahead and adjust these values so they are right inside the Collider boundary box. We don't want these to be outside the Collider box because they might think we are on the ground if we are touching a wall with the same ground layer. And once we have a value that looks good, let's go back to our Raycast value and modify that the same way. So let's add Collider Offset to our transform.position. And instead of creating a new line here, we are going to add an OR statement. So let's copy this code here and let's write two vertical lines to indicate this is an OR statement and then let's paste the code in after it. This time let's modify it so that we subtract by Collider Offset. And now if we go back in Unity, our ground detection is just about perfect. Now that we have our character feeling good, let's go ahead and make it look good too. In Celeste, I noticed they do a sprite squeeze whenever the character jumps or lands, so I wanted to recreate that effect in Unity. In episode 1 of the series, we placed our character animation in a subset of children. The reason we did this was because we want to be able to change the local scale of the sprite without affecting the rigid body or the collider. So to do this, I need to set up a reference to our character holder object in our script. So under components, let's write public game object character holder. Then I'm going to paste this IE numerator function in for our jump squeeze. This basically takes three parameters, one for our X and Y squeeze values, and a third for how long we want the animation to last. The X and Y squeeze values represent the new values for our X and Y local scale. We keep track of the sprite's current local scale values here with original size. Then we create a new size based on these new X and Y local scale values. And once those are defined, we use lerp to animate the frames from original size to new size. And when that's complete, we simply repeat that code to go from the new size back to the original size. So then to use this function, let's add this to our jump function. Since it's a quarantine as defined by IE numerator, we need to use start quarantine to call this function. So let's write start quarantine and then let's put jump squeeze inside the parentheses. For the parameters, let's put 0.5 for the X value, 1.2 for the Y value, and let's put 0.1 for the duration. Then back in Unity, let's link up our character holder game object. 
And if we press play, a quick test shows us this animation whenever we jump in the air. And we can actually do the same thing for when we land after a jump. If we go back into our script under our update function, let's create a new boolean called was on ground and set it equal to the on ground value. Then below the on ground reference, let's create a new if statement. Let's write if not was on ground and on ground, then let's define our jump squeeze quarantine. This basically says if we were not on the ground, but then detected ground collision this frame, this means we just landed. So like in our jump function, we define this quarantine except let's reverse the x and y scale values. And a quick test in Unity now shows us a cool squeeze effect both when we jump and when we land. To the naked eye, you might not even notice this effect, but that's the point. You want your game to feel and look very fluid. And before I let you go, let's set up a quick animation for falling. Let's create a new animation file for falling, and I'm just going to set it to a single frame. The objective here is to make it look like our character is about to land. Then we want to set up a transition to transition to this whenever our vertical velocity is below zero. We can track this by setting up our vertical animation parameter in our script. So back in our code, let's copy our horizontal line, and instead let's change horizontal to vertical, and let's change rb.velocity.x to rb.velocity.y. And then let's set up a transition so that when vertical is less than zero, our falling animation is active. And then let's quickly set up a reverse transition for when our character is back on the ground. And there you have it. If you made it this far, you should have a running and jumping character controller that feels and looks as good as some of my favorite games. Although stay tuned for next week where we take this character controller and add in features like wall jump and set up our camera to follow us around the scene. I'd also like to thank Greg Clark as well as my other Patreons for supporting me this month. That's all for this video, I will see you next week.